Welcome back, Press fans. Coming to you from Altman Studios in downtown Brentwood, to your ears wherever you are. This is Clocked with Press. I'm Jacob Menez, here as always with Kyle Szymanski. We're chatting today about Alexis Gabe, water conservation in Brentwood, and land development. But before all that, let's hear a quick word from today's sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by our friends at Sip and Scoop in downtown Brentwood. Sip and Scoop delivers smiles for miles, sip by sip, and scoop by scoop. Gelato, Italian ice, and signature coffee beverages are just a few of the delicious treats on their menu. Stop by Sip and Scoop at 234 Oak Street in downtown Brentwood to get your fix. They're also on DoorDash. Thanks once again to today's sponsor. Here we go. Fire Chief Brian Helmick has been named the Brentwood Chambers Citizen of the Year for 2022. Really, I think if you know people aren't familiar with Brian Helmick, I think he really should be named Citizen of the Decade because he really orchestrated the the merger of the East Contra Costa Fire Protection District with the Contra Costa County Fire Protection District, which is something that this community has been needing for as long as I can remember. I mean, at least, literally, at least 10 years. So all the kudos to him. It's a huge accomplishment for him, and this is just the first step in what I hope is several... Uh, key acknowledgments of his efforts. And that merger, of course, was a long time coming. We talked about it on the podcast several times over the past several months as they were going through it. We would be remiss if we didn't mention the other award winners. Handy Dads Incorporated was selected as Business of the Year, and Sarops Miss International, the Delta, was chosen as the Nonprofit of the Year. Dalton Wedger, a network administrator at Redbox Business Solutions here in town, was Employee of the Year. And Youth of the Year's Tatiana Torres. And there's going to be a huge party community coming up here on uh, August 18th from 5 to 8 p.m. at Brentwood's DeLuna Ranch, 7540 Belfour Road. You can visit the Chamber of Commerce's website to purchase those tickets. I believe they're $60. Anybody can come as long as they buy a ticket. Absolutely. You, have to, you don't have to be awarded or know someone who's been there. All right. And the Delta Gallery, in association with, with the John Marsh Trust, is hosting an art show coming up at the Life and Times of John Marsh. The theme is anything related to John Marsh, the John Marsh House, Rancho Los Maganos, or pastoral views of Contra Costa County as it would have appeared in the 1850s. The Delta Gallery is doing a bunch of different shows right now. They've got their quarter three, I believe, art show that's wrapping up at the end of September. So you can see that while you're there as well. But they're just always doing something. They're really trying to get themselves out there, which I think is terrific. Yeah, and you know, I've said this a lot of times, but you know, th- this place is at the streets of Brentwood, and so for those people who are dragged there to shop, <laughs> this is a good, you know, segue to kind of move away and look at art. It's a re- beautiful establishment, it's relaxing, great views, good music, it's usually air conditioned for those who are trying to kind of beat the heat, and uh, you get to Look at good art. So what more could you ask for, Jake? And it really is tucked away because, you know, the streets of Brentwood seems like a, seems like the last place you'd expect to find an art gallery. It's tucked in between like the candy apple shop, I think, and like a Hollister. Yeah, you just don't want to mix those two. You don't want to bring in your candy apple <laughs> and get it on the art. But That's how you get a mixed media <laughs> presentation. Yeah. And let's get back on topic here. <laughs> there is going to be a 20-minute film prepared by the John Marsh Historic Trust highlighting the importance of John Marsh and that will premiere at a free public reception where you can meet the artists, enjoy light refreshments, and chat with art lovers and local historians. And that is on August 13th from 6 to 8 p.m. And then if you can't make the August 13th date for that celebration, the show will be continuing through September 2nd. So there's always still time to see it for the next, what is that, four or five weeks? Jumping from Brentwood into Oakley, a group of mosquitoes has tested positive for West Nile virus in Contra Costa County. This, uh, the particular group we're talking about is in Oakley, according to the Contra Costa Mosquito and Vector Control District. This is the first group of mosquitoes to test positive for the virus this year in this county. And I think the important thing to remember here is obviously, you know, these warnings come out. It's a big splash, you know, oh, West Niles in East County. And it is. It is here. But I think people need to, uh, you know, not freak out because it's important to remember that West Nile virus really impacts those with, you know, um, compromised immune systems, people that are a little bit, you know, compromised health-wise. And it's very easy to combat. You just want to keep standing water from, you know, building up. And one thing that's really important, and I think I've said this before, is the the Contra Costa Mosquito and Vector Control District, you know, you can report problems to this organization. They're really nice about it, right? So if you have an issue, maybe a standing pool or, you know, something that's not being taken care of, they will come to your house and they will help you address it. 
and there's going to be no repercussions, right? It's a free service. They come out, you know, for example, if you have some standing water and you do happen to have some mosquito larvae in there, which is how this whole West Nile virus really builds up, they have little fish that they just throw in there. The fish eat the larvae and problem solved once you drain the water. So it's just important to not keep standing water around and report your neighbors if you need to. It's just important to also remember that certain species of birds may carry the virus. And once a mosquito bites an infected bird, the mosquito beca can become infected with the ability to transmit the virus to another animal or person through a single mosquito bite. And the viruses can grow more efficiently when temperatures are consistently warmer than 55 degrees, which is why we're seeing it here in summer. Well, and you really took the words out of my mouth. I, I don't want to minimize West Nile because it is a fairly alarming disease, obviously. But it's the same song and dance. We get this every year. You said viruses can grow once it's more than 55 degrees. In California, in this part of the area, that's, you know, 10 months out of the year. <laughs> no one here is unfamiliar with West Nile and just the basic precautions, you know, don't have standing water and all that good stuff. Don't touch a dead bird. We reported, I think, a couple weeks ago on the podcast about the first dead bird with West Nile. So this is just an escalation of that process, obviously. But with common sense, it shouldn't be too alarming to anybody, I think. Kyle, how about you take us into sports to give us something a little bit more uplifting? Absolutely. We have some baseball players that were chosen for an all-star game. Two players from the Delta region have been selected to the 20th annual Perfect Game All-American Classic on Sunday, August 28th at Chase Field in Phoenix, Perfect Game has announced. Ryder Helfrich and Cal Randall of Discovery Bay will be part of the team. Helfrich attends Clayton Valley Charter in Concord and Randall De La Salle also in Concord. And the Perfect Game All-Star Classic offers a glimpse of some of the most talented young athletes from around the world and provides the baseball community a sneak peek at several young players who want to make their mark at the collegiate and major league levels of the sport. That includes 250 Perfect Game All-American Classic participants who have gone on to play Major League Baseball, while 31 All-American Classic alums were selected on the first day of the 2002 Major League Baseball Amateur Draft held last month. And the rosters for the 2022 All-American Classic were chosen by a panel of talent evaluators assembled by Perfect Game after being scouted and identified through a series of tournaments and events, including Perfect Game's National Showcase recently in St. Petersburg, Florida. I think the pedigree for Perfect Game speaks for itself, obviously. You know, the fact that, what would you say, 250 of those players have gone on to play major league after being part of that is terrific. I think it's amazing. We have all this talent in the community, and they don't even attend local schools. So it's important to always... Take a look at what's what's around us to see what's in our community. Of course, not to take away from our local schools, which are also doing terrific. I think there's something in the water out here. <laughs> Just we got so many good athletes. Cameron McKinney, who's only eight years old, is a rising wakeboarding star. He had his first contest in April, the Western Regional in Utah, and that was a qualifier for nationals. And while competing there, he was competing in the junior beginner boys division, which is for ages 10 and under. Despite going against older competitors, he won his competition, earning a spot at the World Wake Association National Championships in Florida. And McKinney trains with Chad Lowe at Cal Wake, a school in Discovery Bay. And the pressure will be on this weekend, Jake, when he attends the National Championships in Florida until August 7th. He enters the event as the second-ranked rider in his class. But when he comes back from all this fun, he'll head to school, where he'll attend third grade at All God's Christian School in Discovery Bay. I can't stress enough how impressed I am, like I said, with our athletes in general, but this kid especially, he's eight years old and he's already, you know, going to national stuff. I was not an athletic kid, so kids like this, I, I can't even fathom the uh, the amount of practice that it takes. Yeah, and while I was, you know, getting the story together for this week's issue, a lot of people said, you know, what is wakeboarding? And I think the easiest way to describe it is to check out our issue, our paper this week, because we have a fantastic uh, series of pictures of young Cameron really tearing up the water. It's really cool to see, and congratulations to him, and I think he's going to go on to even do bigger things. We have a lot of talented youth in this community. The Brentwood Lady Basketball Villains 12U team, composed of players from East County and beyond, were recently crowned the East Contra Costa County Queens of the Court after winning the top-notch tournament at Concord High School. The team defeated Team Elevate, Team Bueno, and East County Hornets to win the tournament. The team was formed in June when Brentwood's Basketball Villains Club held their elementary, middle school, and high school summer tryouts. Those tryouts attracted hopefuls from Discovery Bay, Oakley, Brentwood, Antioch, Berkeley, and as far away as Napa to showcase their skills and compete for a spot on the team. 
The team is coached by Tommy Patterson, and obviously they're doing quite well here, Jake. If you remember on this week's episode, on this week's interview, you and I spoke with Vincent Baldwin of East County Revolution Football Club, and they just kicked off their recreational season with a series of games last weekend. The newly formed organization is the merger between Impact Soccer Club and Ajax East Bay Soccer Club, and the year-round club, which currently has 1,800 players, is open to ages 2 through adult. And the organization's president, Vincent Baldwin, recently joined, clocked in with the press here in Brentwood about the organization. And to hear that episode, visit thepress.net. And of course, for more information on East County Revolution, visit www.revolutionfc.org. Continuing to talk about soccer, how does West Coast soccer prepare their players for a season ahead? Last weekend, coach Troy Dyack took his West Coast soccer team to Yosemite National Park for some life lessons, team bonding, and fitness. The girls stayed together at a lake house at Pine Mountain Lake in Groveland where they enjoyed kayaking, paddle boat races, swimming, and just hanging out together at the beautiful lakefront property. They also hiked to Vernal Falls. For those who have not had that beautiful experience, the lower part of the hike is paved and scenic and runs along the river. But when you cross the Merced River and hike through the mist, you have to go up 600 granite steps to a 317-foot vernal falls. When at the top, the team ate their packed lunch, took a dip in the pool, and began their hike down the misty trail. I think there's, I think there's something neat about that where it is, it sounds fun, obviously, it's a great recreational activity going hiking like that, but I'm sure as a soccer player, that hike is probably also considered some sort of form of cross-training, just getting those legs strengthened up. I think it's a great idea because, you know, a lot of people, you know, athletes say, oh man, I kind of, I dread training, right? What better place to train than Yosemite? You can take in nature, enjoy the sights, enjoy the sounds, and all the while, you're training. That's it for the sports, Jake. But let's get back to the news, shall we? Before we do that, Kyle, we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our sponsor. When we come back, though, we're going to talk about Alexis Gabe, water conservation, and land development in Brentwood. So don't go anywhere. Today's episode of Clocked In With The Press is brought to you by our friends at Sip & Scoop in downtown Brentwood. Sip & Scoop started out as a food truck serving coffee, hot cocoa, and desserts on the go, but the demand was so high that they had to open a shop at 234 Oak Street. Here at Clocked In, we love Sip and Scoop. They're just a few doors down from our offices, and we're there often enough that they know our names and orders. It's like cheers, but better, because there's dessert. Try their cold brew coffee, or choose a latte or Americano for a classic coffee drink that can't be beat. And we haven't even talked about their breakfast sandwiches and avocado toast. Have I mentioned the root beer flows and the iced lemonades? Those are my personal favorites. <sighs> okay, obviously I could talk about food all day, but here's the point. You gotta go to Sip and Scoop. Visit them at 234 Oak Street in downtown Brentwood, or have Sip and Scoop brought to you wherever you are by DoorDash. Having an event? Let Sip and Scoop cater it. Give them a call at 925-684-7710 to find out more. Thanks again to this week's sponsor. Let's get back into it. Brentwood residents will be voting on a city council-sponsored measure in November election designed to protect open space and parks from future development. Yeah, this was part of the July 26th meeting, which was thankfully in the shorter meetings they only had a few agenda items, and it was one that the council unanimously approved. But the, the long and the short of it is, you know, land, certain lands will be designated as voter protection open space. And they can only be used for open spaces such as parks, agriculture, and recreational use for everyone, meaning it can't be developed into like housing, essentially. Uh, that designated land would also include places like Brentwood Country Club, Shadow Lakes, and Deer Valley Golf Courses. And the proposal includes 175 parcels of land. But that being said, Kyle, there are some exceptions to this. If some of that land that's been proposed as part of the open space, if it's needed for roads or public water or wastewater, storm drains, water recycling facilities, anything like that, it's an exception that land can be used for that. Like I said, just can't be used for stuff like housing developments. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity for the community because if our listeners remember a few years ago, there was measure L and it was kind of similar. It was about the protection of a certain open space here in town. And the community just rallied against this plan. Obviously the, the land that was on the ballot last time was going to be used for a housing project, a proposed housing project, and the residents just shot it down without question. So I think this is kind of a follow-up to that, and it's a good opportunity to protect open space forever, right? um, And this way there will be no question about it in the future. And one thing I've found is that I've been at the paper a year now, and one thing I've found is both the council and the citizens as well seem to be very passionate about, with their opinions on stuff like land development and housing developments. 
you know, we see time and again, anytime we do a story that pertains to construction, we hear a lot from both sides of the aisle, pro and con. And I think it's great that people are able to have these discussions. Okay. But one thing I want to mention about this story, because it's going to come up again in, in, a, in the next story, is one of the things, one of the challenges to that the city had to consider for this bill was Senate Bill 330, which prohibits cities from enacting new laws on the local level that impact or delay construction of housing developments. So the way this one worked, they were able to skirt that a little bit, but that does but that is something that you know is often the city's hands are tied with the the state government telling them no, you have to have X number of houses to to combat the housing crisis essentially. And actually, it does lead us into our next story, which staying in Brentwood, the city is asking residents to voluntarily reduce their water consumption by fifteen percent. That means a lot of things for the city, but for residents, really the Cliff Notes version of it is don't wash your car in the driveway. If you're, you need a car wash, you need to go to one of our facilities in the city that does use recycled water or reclaimed water, and you really shouldn't be running your sprinklers during the day. Run them at night to prevent evaporation and waste of water. Yeah, and Jake, this is actually a stage two of the city's water shortage contingency plan, but it's not officially moving into that stage. Uh, the, the contingency plan is a policy that breaks down conservation measures into six levels, with level one being the mildest that outlines how to use less water. The first level, which Brentwood is currently in, encourages voluntary conservation rather than implementing mandatory water restrictions. And that exactly, that's exactly. Even though these measures about don't wash your car in the driveway are listed as part of step stage two in the conservation plan, which is available to, on the city website for everyone to look at, the city is still formally in step one, which is everything is voluntary. And so for that reason, if you know if you are washing car and driver, the city isn't currently focused on punitive measures. They're not going to fine you. They're more interested in educating you on why you shouldn't be doing this. You know, a lot of people wonder, well, how much water does the city have? So Brentwood has an estimated 7 billion gallons of drinking water. And even with no further conservation efforts, the city is expected to use 3 billion to 4 billion gallons of it during the summer the city will use between one-third and one-half of its one billion gallons of recycled water. Correct. Yeah, Mickey Sabota, who is the, um, he's the director of the Public Works Department, spoke at the meeting. He gave this long presentation about all this, and he's super knowledgeable. But his big takeaway was there's no water shortage in Brentwood. There's really no fear of a water shortage, barring some sort of catastrophic event. He said, you know, like an earthquake or something of that nature, which, you know, no one's hoping for. We're all hoping that doesn't happen, obviously. But that's the key takeaway. Even though we only plan to use, only expect the city to use a, about half its water supplies, both recycled and drinking, these conservation efforts, we're in a drought. Statewide, we're in a drought. So these conservation efforts are just a prudent measure more than anything else. And one thing that I found interesting in linking back up to the previous, to the previous story we were talking about, the Senate Bill 330, is during the public comments portion of, the, of, this, of this agenda item, the water conservation one, there were the comments that were there were really concerned the city was being hypocritical. One thing they thought was interesting about this meeting was during the public comment portion of this agenda item, the one about water conservation, is when the public came in and they were all very concerned the city was being hypocritical by asking residents to conserve while the city continues to develop houses. So the city is doing their part as well, Jake. They are not going to water non-functional turf at silly facilities or landscaping at commercial and industrial sites. Correct. That non-functional turf is going to end up being stuff like the, all the plants in front of the police station, which we'll see either be replaced with drought-resistant plants or we'll just see it wither up and die. It's kind of undetermined so far. Six months after the disappearance of Alexis Gabe, her family has released a timeline of events in the days afterward as they continue to search for her body. Jake, I know you've written a lot about this story. Why don't you delve into it a bit? Right, so what happened, Kyle, was Gwyn Gabe, who is Alexa's father, released a nine-page document on Facebook in his uh, Facebook group on Wednesday. It's a document that the Anak police had given to him that created a timeline of events through Alexis's January 26th disappearance through June 2nd, which, if you recall, was the press conference where Oakley police, who were the lead investigators at the time, announced that Alexis was the victim of foul play and that their, their suspect, Marshall Jones, had been killed in a police altercation in Washington. Police said that the information was based on cell phone records, a forensic download of Alexis's Infinity that included GPS locations, forensic cell phone extractions, surveillance video, and interviews. And this is what Cox said, and this was a, a not an all-inclusive list of the investigation, obviously. Investigators have been working on this since day one, six months ago. And I think the interesting part of it, I think the part that people really latch on to, is just how quickly, you know, that she disappeared on January 26th. January 27th, the family is talking to the police about she didn't come home last night. And that same day, police are already speaking to Marshall Jones because he was, you know, a person of interest in the case. And it's amazing how, because before we've gotten tidbits of information, 
And this is the first time we've really seen what the timeline was for that, how quickly police were reacting. Some of the measures that we didn't know about until now as well were revealed in the document. And like I said, it's a nine-page document. It's a lot to go into, so I would encourage people to read it on our website. We've posted the whole thing. It's www.thepress.net, like you don't already know that. The things that police have done, just a few things that they've done, is they've looked at, they've drained an 8 million gallon pond in Pioneer and, of course, multiple land, air, and water searches by several different law enforcement agencies. And this was correct. You're right. This was, again, this was the first time they've detailed a lot of that stuff. We knew about the pond. We had spoken about that with Chief Paul Beard, and I had him on the podcast about two or three weeks ago. And, but we didn't really know the nature of which, which law enforcement agencies have been helping. But this document shows it was search and rescue from Pinole. It was, excuse me, I meant, Search and Rescue from Pioneer, it was the FBI, it was just a huge undertaking by so many different agencies. And again, they were, you know, Marshall Jones was in Washington, he left for Washington in, I think, February, according to this document, and they were still, you know, pounding the pavement in town here. The authorities were trying to get that evidence on him. Yeah, and it's important to remember that, you know, this sounds like this is a wealth of information, and it is, but the key thing that's still out there that's unanswered is where is Alexis Bu- Alexis's body, or where is Alexis? Correct, and the family is still looking for help with that. Obviously, they're still doing weekend searches, and that can be all found on Gwyn Gabe's Facebook group, like I'd mentioned earlier. But for their part, the family, they're also trying some more unorthodox methods. I know this weekend they're going to go attend a show by television medium Teresa Caputo. She's the Long Island medium on, I think, TLC. They have tickets to that that someone gifted them, and I believe they're trying to get her to speak to them and see if she can offer her assistance. I know Gwyn had posted on... Teresa Caputo's Facebook page, and just his story, which of course at this point is national news, so she would not be unfamiliar with it. And when I wrote the story yesterday, this is recording this on Thursday, so when I wrote the story on Wednesday, over 2,000 people had already, you know, reacted to Gwyn's Facebook post. So we'll see if Teresa takes notice. Let's just hope there's a resolution in this case, and it's always good to remember that there's a $100,000 reward fund for people who come forward and lead to Alexis's body. Kyle, that's all I've got for the news. What do you have for us to bring us home? Well, we got a couple of weekend events. We got the Cruising Blues Car Show and Concert on Saturday. The Downtown Brentwood Coalition is hosting the Cruising Blues Car Show and Concert on Saturday, August 6th from 2 to 7 p.m. in Downtown Brentwood. There will be food, beer, wine, prizes, music, and a free blues concert from 3 to 6 p.m. You can register for the car show. It's $25, and you can visit the press.net calendar page to sign up. And for those people who are not into cars, there's a Trinkets and Treasures flea market same day at the Oakley Senior Center. That's from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Vendors will be selling new and used items. The Senior Center is at 215 2nd Street in Oakley. And for more information, you can call 925-626-7223. And Jake, before we leave, let's remind people to take a look at our special sections. We have a big one coming up on August 19th. It's going to focus on East County sports with a heavy dose of football. Everyone loves football in this community. We're going to give you previews of all six BVAL teams. I'm expecting a really cool and fun season, and um, all the teams are going to be improved. So check that out on August 19th. I think it's going to be fun. I mean, this community loves sports. We just got a new sports writer as well for the paper, so look for his byline. You know, our sports coverage is expanding, which I think is great. The community, like I said, they love sports, and so we love sports as well, obviously. But on that note, that's it for today's episode of Clocked with the Press. We appreciate you, the listeners, taking the time, and we look forward to speaking with you in future episodes. If you want to read more news stories from Contra Costa County, you can do so on our website. Once again, that's www.thepress.net. Or you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and now TikTok at press underscore net. Be sure to tune in again next week for all your local news and sports highlights. Contact us with your thoughts on this episode or anyone before it by emailing podcasts at brownpress.com. And this Tuesday, tune in to hear Melissa talk with Jessica and Chris Bussman, the owners of Surrogacy Partnership, which is a local surrogacy agency. Until then, thanks for listening, and you'll hear from us real soon. This is Jake and Kyle clocking out. again to this week's sponsor, Sip and Scoop. Remember that feeling of hearing the ice cream truck coming down the street as a kid? Bring back that feeling by visiting Sip and Scoop. They started out as a truck too, and now they have a brick and mortar shop right here in Brentwood, so you don't have to chase them down the block. Sip and Scoop has all kinds of high quality desserts to satisfy any sweet tooth. 
gelato, root beer floats, and iced coffees are just a few of my favorites. And the whole menu is available to go on DoorDash. Stop by their shop in downtown Brentwood and get your scoop on.